Dear students, let us start our discussion on the design of facilities and as a part of it, we have been discussing about the parking facilities. In the previous interaction, we talked about the pricing ways in which the on street parking can be priced by way of uh, putting either uh, the desk or the meters or the coupons etc. We talked about the parking for disabled people and then we started discussing the office street parking facilities. And of the street parking facilities, we have looked at uh, the surface lots and we have also talked about the underground parking facility. In today's interaction, we are continuing with that and we will be looking at the rest of the office street parking facilities, the various patterns in which it can be done, the parking space norms and the parking supply and the related or associated characteristics with that. So, let us start with our off street parking facilities again. So, when we talked about uh, the underground parking facilities in the previous interaction, we said that we are going to talk certain things when we will take up the multi level car parking facilities and those were related with the design elements of ramps etc. Now, these multi level parking facilities, they are going to be provided in an area where lot of activity is there. So, we are providing multiple levels and on these multiple levels, the vehicles are going to be parked, but obviously the development is there in the adjoining area and there is lot of activity and because of this activity there is going to be parking demand and this parking demand if is being satisfied at the ground level is going to consume a lot of ground and therefore, what is being thought of is that if we use this limited ground and go in the vertical direction, then we can satisfy this parking demand. At the same time, the problems which are going to be there on the roads in this developed area will be nullified, eliminated or reduced. But obviously, when you do this type of uh, structure, it is going to be a costly affair. Now, when we talk about this cost of this structure, then how we are going to meet out. So, there are possibilities as we said that public agency can be there or a private agency can be there which can manage this lot. Now, whosoever is doing this, there are ways in which we should try to recover the cost of this type of construction as well as the operation or maintenance of that facility. So, one thing which says is that within a distance of 1 kilometers of this, so if we say that this is 1 kilometer, within this area no parking should be allowed at the ground level that is very first thing. If at all it has to be allowed because of few reasons, then the cost of parking at the ground level that means on the street should be escalated. It should be very high value. So, when we say very high value, it can be something like 3 to even 20 times higher than the off street parking fee. It all depends on what is the cost of the land in that area, what are the various important activities which are going on, what is the role of that area in the GDP. So, all those things are going to decide that how much is this escalation which is going to be there. Then the another point is that whatever this development is there in this area, if all of these things have been managed by the same agency which is managing the MLCP then this is going to be beneficial for that agency. In that sense, when we say then this whole area is being defined as the parking business district. So, we can enmark a parking business district which may have a radius of uh, say 1 kilometer around it and then the whole of the management of that area is being given to a one agency and then that agency is getting the money out of those uh, developments and that is how it satisfies the requirements with respect to the MLCP either in terms of the construction cost, operation or maintenance cost. Another thing is that uh, in all these areas because there are a lot of activities, if possible then we should try to see that whether IPTs or NMVs, non motorized vehicles, they can be allowed in that area or not. Then there should be a implementation, I already said the parking business district that is uh, one issue which has to be taken up. And there should be at least one single lane in front of the MLCP for the entry and exit 
but when we say this one single lane then this single lane should be a sort of a frontage lane it should not be a lane which is being taken from the main carriageway or the main highway and we say okay this lane is being utilized for the vehicles which are entering or exiting from the mlcp so there should not be any disturbance to the traffic which is moving on the main carriageway and in that sense as i said in the case of surface lot also we should try to identify a location of an entry and exit which is away from this maybe on a side road and that is going to be helpful more rather than having it on the main highway. So, here you can see that uh, there is a uh, one MLCP where uh, here at this point you can find there is an open area and this open area means it is uh, provided for uh, natural light as well as for air ventilation of this area. So, natural air as well as light is flowing through that. Here also we can see that these are the open spaces being provided and there are different levels and on which the vehicles can be parked at different points. The point here is that uh, when we have this type of uh, big facility then we should have uh, the information system. So, this information system should be able to tell the parker at the entry of that area itself when you are park coming from here. So, you are entering this area at that location itself it should tell that you should go to floor 1 parking bay area 275 which is vacant. So, that is how the people will keep moving to the designated locations otherwise the lot of time is going to be wasted in the search of uh, the spaces. Now, when we look at the design features of MLCP now these are also going to be valid for underground parking facility as uh, I said in the previous interaction that uh, they are going to be same. So, we are going to talk them together. So, one thing is the ramp gradient because you are going at top or down. So, the ramp has to be used for the movement of the vehicle. So, this is 1 in 10 desirable, 1 in 8 is in exceptional conditions. When we are looking at the clear height between the floors then it is 2.1 meters from the bottom of the roof beam and the top of the pavement surface. So, that means we are talking from here to this point. So, this is what is the distance we are looking at. And if the fire fighting systems have been installed and they are being installed towards the roof then the clearance has also to be taken with respect to those type of systems. Parking stall dimension is usually considered as 2.5 meters by 5 meters. Inside radius of the curves on the ramps is 7 meters. Width of the traffic lane on the ramp or at the entrance is 3.75 meters. The gradient of the sloping floors is not more than 1 in 20 and the illumination level as we discussed in the case of uh, underground parking 2 is uh, minimum 3 watts per meter square. So, here we can see that there is a ramped uh, structure being provided to go to different levels. So, uh, we are going to levels by way of these curvatures. So, 7 meter internal radius the 3.75 meters wide having a slope of 1 in 10 or, or 1 in 8. So, that is how the things needs to be designed. So, this helps the vehicle to go up and down in a smoother manner. Now, the another way of providing the parking is a roof top parking. Now, this roof top parking is usually used in those areas where the land cost is too high. And when this land cost is too high, there is a lot of development which is taking place in that area and the city administration or the authorities they are going to get more money out of those developments, then they will not be interested to give a land for the construction of MLCP. And in fact, the surface parking is not going to be feasible in any form. In such circumstances, whatever is the developed area is there that the roof of that developed area can be utilized for the parking of the vehicles. But obviously, when you are talking about the top of the building then the vehicle has to be taken there. So, it can be either in the form of ramps or it can be either in the form of the lift. So, the vehicle is being lifted to the top and it is being parked in location. So, it is a assisted system which is going to be there or if the ramps are being provided for entry and exit separately then the vehicle can be driven to that location parked and the person can come back. Again for the movement of the 
those passengers or drivers uh, between the floors or from the top to the ground level, we need to provide various other type of pedestrian facilities. But when we are putting so many vehicles at the top of a building, one another thing which is to be taken into consideration is the structural design of the roofs because the roof should be able to sustain the loads of the vehicles which have been parked at the top of it. So, this is also an important issue. Here you can see that there is a total development is there and these rooftops are being utilized for the parking of vehicles. This is how it looks like as being shown in the another photograph and that is how the requirement or the demand is being satisfied with respect to the parking. Now, what are the various patterns in which these multi-level parking systems can be operated? So, these parking systems can be operated either in the totally automated form or they can be operated as a semi-automated form. Now, when we are talking about the semi-automated form, then again there can be two ways of doing it. Of course, there are multiple things which can be done in terms of innovations. So, a stack parking is there and a rotary parking is there. When, when we look at the automated system, then there are puzzle parking and the tower parking. So, let us have a look on what are these different type of parkings or the patterns of parkings which are there. Now, when we say there is a stacking of the vehicles, so this is how it looks like. And as I talked previously also in the mechanical system where we said that we can increase the capacity of the same parking area by way of having the parking one above the other by using these mechanical lift systems. So, this is how it looks like. So, what you can see is that this is a movable floor which can move up and down and here the two vehicles have been parked and at the same time there are two vehicles which are being parked at the ground level and that is where in place of two now we have four. So, it is one is to two. So, the capacity which otherwise could have been 100 is now 200. So, that is how the, um, the working can be done, but when you are doing this and when you have to operate uh, this floor up and down, then the attendant is required to look after it. So, this is one requirement which is there. Of course, we can say when these attendants are required, it is a sort of an employment generation and that is another positive aspect of uh, using this type of a facility. Now, when we have a rotary parking, you can just see here that there is a system wherein this keeps moving in this form as a clockwise movement is going to be there. It is sort of uh, in the fairs you have uh, all those uh, sort jhulas etcetera. So, that is the thing uh, we are talking here. This is being used at Kalkaji. So, it is again a semi-automated system where the vehicle will come to this area this vehicle is being accepted by the employees of uh, this parking area. Then there are going to be a vacant spaces. So, this vehicle is going to be placed on that and using the turntable then this is being rotated and uh, the next vacant space will come at location where the, again the vehicle will be parked and that is how this keeps going on. So, a mechanical system is going to be there. There is going to be a use of a turntable so as to operate it. And there is also a requirement that persons who are going to do it uh, assisting the drivers who are bringing their vehicles to be parked in this area. Now, here you can see a puzzle parking. So, puzzle parking means you do not know where the space is that is to be identified. It is a total automated system because uh, the sensors are there and those sensors are going to tell whether these spaces are vacant. But usually when it is going to be filled and we have to move the vehicles, then we need to have the uh, one or two slops which are being kept vacant. So, that if there is a requirement of moving the cars from one location to another, then that can be done. And there is a platform on which the car is being placed and then this platform is moved up and down as well as horizontally. So, that wherever there is a location where this can be placed, it will be taken to that location. So, this is a type of a puzzle parking which may be there. There can be a tower parking. So, in this tower parking also uh, using the lifts the vehicles are being taken and the two spaces per floor they are kept again vacant. So, that uh, when, when there is a movement of the vehicles in and out. So, you need to have those spaces and that is how this is going to be managed. Now, when we look at the uh, space which is required for parking, then the guidelines give this information. It says that for a car, 
20 to 36 meter square is required. For a bus, 55 to 60 meter square is required. For truck, 55 to 60 meter square. And for a three wheeler, 10 to 15 meter square space is required. So, if we have a big space available to us, then on the basis of these guidelines, we can design the tentative spaces which are going to be there for the parking of vehicles. Now, the stall sizes are also being defined. We have looked at this aspect previously too, where in one table we have seen that for a different angles of parking and for different categories of vehicles, the information was given. And there the two things were defined, one was the stall size and another was, was the circulation space. So, if you are talking about the individual parking, then 3 meters by 6 meters is what being dedicated to a car, but if it is a community parking, continuously so many vehicles are going to be parked together, then it is 2.5 meters by 5 meters. In the case of trucks as well as in the case of locations where the loading and unloadings are going to be there and obviously these loadings and unloadings mostly are going to happen with respect to trucks, the space which is being marked for the parking of these vehicles is 3.75 meters by 7.5 meters. So, these are the size of the stalls which needs to be provided. Now, another important point is the equivalent car space. Now, one thing which we discussed when we talked about the traffic at the very start, we said that there is going to be a PCU value, passenger car unit. Now, this is with respect to parking. We are talking about ECS. So, equivalent car spaces. So, if we are having a size uh, of a stall as like 2.5 meter by 5 meter for one car. Now, in that how many two wheelers or how many buses uh, are going to be required to be provided. So, that is the thing we are looking at. So, if we need a truck or bus to be powered, it should have 2.5 times the size of the stall which we are talking for a car or a taxi. But when you are looking at a cycle rickshaw, then it is 0.8 times of that. So, this is another way that uh, we can devise the, the method or we can try to find out the spaces to be marked by vehicle type. So, once you have a big area which is available, we can define okay at this point we are going to have cars, at this point we are going to have trucks, here we are going to park two wheelers or here we are going to park the cycle rickshaws. So, depending on these values we can identify and then how many spaces are being dedicated to a type of a vehicle can be also looked at. Now, the code also gives the parking space norms that in a particular development, how sh we should decide that how many parkings should be there. So, one general criteria which is there is a population size and that is less than 50,000 to more than 500,000. So, there is a categorization in this area and with respect to these categorization now for different categories of the land uses, the values have been defined. Now, as the size of the population increases, obviously the requirements are going to be more. So, when we talk about the residential area, then it says that for a residential area, the built up area in meter square should be considered and the categorizations are being given as 50, 75, 100 and 200. Whereas, if you are talking about the lodging or the tourist homes or the hotels, then this is in terms of the number of guest rooms and it says as 2 rooms, 3, 4, 8 or 12, these are the categorizations which have been utilized. So, 1 space per 12 rooms or 1 space per 2 rooms that is what it is saying and it all depends that as you are going towards the higher side, then the numbers are going to increase in terms of the parking spaces. If it is an educational area, then the administrative office area and public service area is counted and again it is going to be in meter square, but the three values are there 35, 50 and 70 meter square. When it is an institutional area, say medical, the number of beds are used and for that it is 2 bed, 5 bed or multiple of 5 beds up to 30 is what is the categorization and again you will have like one parking space per two beds in a city which is having a high population is what we are talking here. Assembly halls, theatres and cinema halls, this is based on the number of seats. 
so they are defined as 10, 15, 25, 80 and 120. For marriage halls or community halls in the plot area, again we have uh, 5 classifications here. For a stadium and exhibition centers, these are again on the basis of uh, number of seats and we have again 5 classifications here going up to 240 seats. Business offices, area occupied, then public or semi-public offices, again the area occupied, industrial or then the space which is being occupied by the industrial units and the storage areas like warehouses etc. the space again being occupied in meter square. So, in all of these cases we are looking at the meter square classification. Now, let us come to the parking supply. Now, in the case of parking supply, uh, we need to see that how many number of uh, stalls can be provided say for the parking of cars or for parking of motorized two wheelers or cycles, cycle rickshaws and so on. Now, this is going to be dependent on various factors. So, when we are looking at an area and in this area how many vehicles can be parked, one thing is whether we are parking the vehicles like this or we are parking the vehicles in this form or we are parking the vehicles just in this way. What exactly is the pattern in which we are doing it? So, first of all we should have this length and breadth. So, the area available is one issue. The again the another thing is this angle. So, angle of parking is the another one because this is going to define whether we are going to require this much space or going to require this much space. And then along with that then this is a circulation area. So, circulation area is also to be looked at. So, we are going to provide 3 meters wide or 6.6 .6 meters wide depending on whether it is one way, two way, whether it is a parking or either of the side of that space. So, those things needs to be also considered, safety margins to be provided. So, one thing which we usually say is that if the vehicle is being parked here, so this is the limit up to which the vehicle is being parked, but at the back of it, then this safety margin is being provided. So, the vehicles which are moving now, they are moving away from it. So, this is uh, the space which is not going to be utilized by any of the vehicle and the turning radii which will be there of different categories of vehicles. So, based on these we may be able to identify that how many vehicles are going to be parked in one area. Now, most of the cases you may find that they have been looked at with respect to the length along which the vehicles are going to be parked and then we are going to utilize these angles and the spaces which are occupied based on those angles. Now, when we talk about those angles, I uh, discussed about it previously too. In the case of motorized two wheelers or non motorized vehicles or IPTs, usually we go for 90 degree parking, but when you are looking at cars and vans, then 60 degree to the curve line. So, in one case 90 degree, in another case this is 60 degree, and in the case of big sized vehicles, it is being kept as 30 degree. So, if the vehicles are coming like this, then this is the orientation in which these vehicles can get in and out. So, this parking supply for an angled parking can be calculated by using this uh, formula say this is L minus W sin theta and this whole is divided by the ratio of W and sin theta, where theta is the angle at which the vehicle is being parked with respect to the curved side. So, longer side of the vehicle is making that uh, angle and W is the width of uh, this parking area and uh, uh, we can see that the length of this parking area is L. So, that L is not coming into picture in the first one when you are talking about an angled parking which can be utilized for 30 degree, 45, 60 degrees. When you have uh, say a uh, perpendicular parking, then it is simply that if this L is the length of the curb side and W is the width of the parking area then L divided by W is going to define that at 90 degree the spaces which are going to be there and we have discussed that this is going to be the maximum. But when you are looking at the parallel condition, then in the case of parallel condition it is L divided by the small L and that is at 180 degree is parking spaces and this is going to result in the minimum value. So, uh, that is the way we can identify that uh, what are going to be the spaces, 
but yes when we are looking at these things we have to also look at the various orientations so that as we discussed previously the dead spaces has to be minimized. Now there is a US practice also the US SCM highway capacity manual it says that we can identify the number of parking spaces by a vehicle type in a service area on the basis of these parameters one is the ADT in the direction of service area average daily traffic another is the usage ratio of that area by a category of vehicle next is the design R factor and this design R factor will convert ADT into the early values and then the stay in hours is another thing so the duration is required to be known here. So when we have to find out the total parking space is required then it is going to be ADT into UR into DHF into L. So when we have ADT and DHF then it gets converted into say the early traffic and then this early traffic is being converted by using the stay duration. So we have vehicles per hour multiplied by R and then the usage ratio is going to define that uh, how much this space is being utilized by that category. So the values for UR, DHF and L they are also being specified and they have been specified for the three categories of vehicles that is cars, buses and trucks for the US conditions and they are being defined as ranging from 0.15 to 0.2 for UR. For DHF it is 0.1 or 0.12 and the length of stay is like 30 minutes or 24 minutes or 36 minutes and it is being converted on a hourly form by use of uh, 60. Now when we use these values and when we talk about uh, per thousand vehicles per day then these are the factors which will come out. So if you have uh, the ADT which is 24,000 because it has been calculated for 1000. So now if you multiply this with 24 you are going to get the values directly also. Let us look at this example where uh, the ADT on the road is being defined as 40,000 and then there is a composition of traffic and there are three categories they are in different compositions at four different locations. So here when we have to calculate the parking spaces the same formula is going to be utilized but along with that we are also because this whole thing is going to be in a generalized form. Now if this is being multiplied with the, uh, the composition then we will get the spaces by vehicle type. So let us look at this. So what it says is ADT on the road is 40,000 vehicles per hour. Now this is not towards the service area. So it means if we assume that there is a 50-50 divide then this comes out to be 20,000 VPD. So considering those 20,000 VPD now if we have to calculate this for cars then this car value is going to be how much? So this is going to be 20,000 multiplied by we have the values. So what is that? UR, DHF and L. Say if we go back UR, DHF and L they are 0 0.15, 0 0.1 and 0 0.5. So it is 0 0.15, 0 0.1 and 0 0.5. So this becomes a generalized condition and then for case 1 it is 75%. So this is in 2.75. So you can check it out whether this comes out to be as 113 or not. So these are the rounded values because you cannot have a part vehicle being parked. So that is why you have to look at in this value. So for all the cases now these values have been calculated and therefore it says that you have to provide 113 car spaces, 10 bus spaces and 44 truck spaces for case 1. Now let us look at uh, uh, the related uh, parking characteristics. The very first thing which we can talk is a parking accumulation. So we have an area and there is a inflow and outflow from this. So vehicles are coming in and getting out. So at any point of a time say when we say 8 am to 8 30 am. This may happen that there are few vehicles which were always already there 
parked at different locations and there are some vehicles which are coming in. So, there are 10 vehicles which are coming in and there are 2 vehicles which are going out. So, if you look at this that there were 3 vehicles which were already there it means 10 plus 3 minus 2. So, it means now they are going to be 11 vehicles in this particular area. So, this is what is going to be the accumulation of the vehicles in this area and this can also be looked at in terms of the classified vehicles by different categories of vehicles too. So, this is number of parked vehicles in an area at any specified moment. It can be divided into journey purpose categories too. It can also be divided in terms of a long term short term parking. So, there are different ways in which it can be looked at, but whatever vehicles are coming to this they are coming because of certain attraction values. So, whatever development is there, this development has a attraction. So, this is happening. Now, when you look at these accumulation, then these accumulations are going to keep changing with respect to time. In the night time, it may happen that if it is a commercial area, then in the commercial area, then night time we have minimum occupation of the parking spaces. But in the daytime and day, within the daytime also when you are talking about the working hours, then it can be maximum. So, it is continuously changing. Now, when this is continuously changing, there is also a possibility in terms of the travel patterns. So, what you may found that in the smaller cities people can go home in the lunch time have a lunch and come back because they may have one hour to do that. But if you are in a bigger city then this type of a phenomena may not be there this pattern may not be there. So, the lunch time dip may not be visible in the case of big cities, but it may be there in the smaller cities. Now, when we are looking at uh, these type of countings there is also a possibility that uh, depending on that what is the time frame which is being considered so as to do this counting there are some vehicles which have not been counted and they have been left and this is 15 to 30 percent based on the count interval as well as the length of the curve which is considered for the counting of the vehicle. So, we started from here has gone this way come like this and then go this way. During this time period what happens is once we have moved to this location and then one vehicle comes here now this is being left this is not being counted. So, this is the percent which is going to be there depending on these uh, count cycles as well as the total space which is being uh, considered at one point of a time. So, here in this one what you can see is that there are two conditions being defined one is for residential area. So, this is a residential area we can see that say somewhere here up to 8 o'clock there are lot many vehicles in the residential area then they starts receding and then it becomes constant that means there are some vehicles which still remain in the residential area they are not going out. And then in the evening again this is increasing and it comes back to the almost the same level at which it was there previously. But when you talk about the office area then in the case of office area this is going to be quite minimum when you look at the early morning or the night. But as the time increases in a day it is starts increasing and then there will be a more or less a saturated condition. So, many of the spaces are being occupied and when you look at after 5 or 6 in the evening then it again starts reducing and comes back to the minimum value because in office area now the vehicles are not going to be there other than one or two that means, the security guards etcetera who are there their vehicles may be there. Now, one thing which is being defined here is a lunch time dip which as I said is a possibility in the smaller cities. So, we may found that this is in reducing like this and then again increasing. So, it is in the time period of something like lunch hour say 1 to 2 pm. So, this is how the things may change. So, we close our interaction now and we will be continuing with the other uh, characteristics and the rest of the things to be considered under the parking facilities in our next interaction. Till then thank you and bye.